There is nothing more bullish in the world than all-time highs. It makes people nervous. It, they say to themselves, how, how can this be? But if you were to only make purchases during all-time highs, you would outperform somebody who dollar cost averaged the rest of the uh, time. Hello, people of the degenerate economy. Howard Lenzen here. If you're looking for great investment and trade ideas from the StockTwits community, be sure to check out our newest newsletter, Chart Art. Every day you will get a free list of five to 10 easily digestible ideas. Ideas you can quickly click through and follow up on, even with the person that shared the idea. Take our email that went out April 22nd, where we highlighted Kava. This stock is up 57% since the email. Or Arista Networks, which we shared on April 24th and is up 39% since. We have dozens of these that have been big winners already for our community. Be sure to go to chartart.stocktwits.com or check the link in the show notes to get the free daily email. Good night from London. Uh, you are here on Trends with Friends. We are we are uh, covering the globe. Uh, I just uh, did my first Wimbledon, broke the cherry. Um, talk about it for a sec. But uh, hello, Barry Ritholtz, joining us from Curry Town, USA, Long Island. I think you're in Long Island. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, Work from home and day. You today. didn't get the message. You and JC are wearing the same colors. It could just be it's blending in. And by the way, you, Barry, you look good. But yet you still make JC look thin, and you look good. Well, Barry and I have nice tans because it's summertime around here in the Northeast. So that's we got to right. show it that's off, right. right, Barry? Come on. So you, that's right, and that's slathering thirty on. And this is what you I two am. are old friends, um, but we have uh, our fourth friend today, uh, regular Michael Perak uh, from Houston. He survived the hurricane. It's what two million people without power right now. Right now, it's still. You know, they, they didn't put the wires in the ground as a uh, very <laughs> So there's, there's literally no compute or AI in Houston. Forgetting food, there's also no compute, which we'll, we will get into. So NVIDIA, NVIDIA could miss a quarter with the hurricane. Uh, I don't know if they're related, but um, so, so we've got uh, Barry Ritholtz as our guest today. Phil's on vacation as usual. Um, Barry, who's the anti-health, uh, the anti-Phil. Um, look at little... I am actually working with Phil. That's what I say. So you look before great. Before you start, I, I feel yeah. So you're good. listening to Phil, Phil? Phil's a you uh, are listening to Phil. Yeah, yeah. Just he's onto something. The uh, he definitely is. JC looks lean. Mike looks lean. Uh, I'm I'm on a binge eating Indian food in in London with friends as we just chatted about. Um, and uh, that's what I do when I come to London. I eat Indian food with JP Regswani. It's unbelievable. Um, Those are London calories. When you come back from the UK, you'll leave So uh, we're going to get right into the markets. But first, uh, if anybody ever gets a chance, you know, I'm almost 59. My first Wimbledon, JC, I just saw a four-hour uh, quarterfinal match, like 10 rows up, uh, Medvedev versus Sinner. Sinner, 22 years old, ranked number one in the world, Ital maybe the first Italian male uh, top seed ever, I think. Um Lost for the first time in five matches to Medvedev in a four, five setter. Um, Max and I got treated to an epic. I, I, and and to, again, I, you know, I'm, I'm a sports fan, but haven't seen tennis since I was a kid when it was Borg, McEnroe, and I think everybody, the women now hit it harder than the men do in that era. But in the fifth set, they were serving at 127 miles per hour still. And um, the pace, it's like it's like watching us play ping pong is like watching men play tennis. So it's really, really kind of a mind bending uh, athlete, just athleticism to to see that. So I just urge anybody who ever has a chance. And by the way, what a great London is built up. I mean, Wimbledon is really a spectacular park slash end of the world kind of train. At the end of the, it's very west, I think, uh, London, but fantastic. Has anybody ever been? Have any of you guys been? Oh, yeah. London's mm -hmm. cool. All the time. No, I mean uh, the Wimbledon. 
<laughs> never, never been to Wimbledon. <laughs> Howard, wasn't there a wasn't there a top seed Italian player a couple of years ago in Wimbledon? Italian? I don't think so. Bettarini, Bettazzini, no, something like that. No, that name that sticks is, out. Top that is ten. A dish. Matteo. That is a dish that you've had many times in Long Island. JC, how do you how do you recommend the Bettacini? That uh, J, J, you're having food. You're going to make me go to Google God food withdrawals. Okay, let's get right to the market, and then we're going to talk uh, what's good, what's bad. AI. I really want to talk AI. Barry has some thoughts. Um, is it too positive? Is it too negative? JC, take it from the top. There is a lot of good happening right now. Not in the headlines. I mean, we'll get to that, but not in the headlines. As I keep saying week after week, the headlines will get worse. It is not what's driving this market. JC, take it away with the, with the charts and then we'll get Barry involved. Yeah, here's here's a good one. Let's start with the first chart there on the dock. You're looking at the NASDAQ 100 going out at new all-time highs relative to the S&P I highlighted down below uh, a few of the key differences between these two indexes. You're looking at 52% tech and then another 15% uh, communications in the NASDAQ 100. Meanwhile, you don't have any financials, no energy, and about half the industrials exposure. So in the S&P 500, you got a lot more financials. You have no financials in the NASDAQ. You've got a bunch of energy, you know, a little bit of energy. You got double the uh, industrial exposure, you know, close to double the healthcare exposure. So you can see the difference in the composition more tech, more growth in the NASDAQ, new all-time highs. Big story. You, you know my thoughts, JC. We've said this time and time again. There, there is nothing more bullish in the world than all-time highs. It makes people nervous. It, they say to themselves, how, how can this be? But if you were to only make purchases during all-time highs, you would outperform somebody who dollar cost averaged the rest of the uh, time. It's kind of fascinating. All-time highs beget more all-time highs. It reflects um, revenue growth. It reflects positive psychology, the increased willingness of investors to pay more and more for a dollar of earnings. Uh, and, and so there's nothing more bullish than all-time Can highs. you explain, Bear, Bear, because you've been around the markets forever. And, and guys, Barry and uh, Josh Brown built Ritholtz Wealth Management. I think it's over $4 billion in assets under management. So it's- Just about five, yeah. You just hit five? Congratulations. We're just about there. Uh, we, what if we, I pull? I'm what waiting pull my for account? the- How far? Uh, are you back under four? Uh, yeah, that would be- <laughs> So, Perry, how, how do we describe this? Because it's like you have to hold the hands of uh, almost $5 billion in assets. Um, and do they believe you? Do they – like – and then the second thing is we have never probably been in a you – know, I wasn't alive during World War II or World War I, but I can't imagine the headlines being any worse – now, that's also driven by social media and, and clicks and everything. But what's amazing about this all time is we've never had more negativity. Maybe not so much. 1970s, maybe. But Michael Batnick has this wonderful chart I use all the time in presentation called There's Always a Reason to Sell. And it shows the past century from the lower left to the upper right. And every year there's some horrific thing happening from wars to terrorist assassinations to political turmoil to pandemics, to you name it, there is always some reason that someone's going to latch onto and say, everything is going to hell. Here's uh, why you should sell. And, you know, for the past century, hell, for the past two centuries, the overall trend in the United States has been up and to the right. Uh, I, I don't see any signs that that long term trend ends. You're certainly going to have a lot of volatility along the way. Um, but but historically, if you're thinking about the long term, if you're investing for retirement in 10, 20, 30 years or for generational wealth or philanthropy or for anything beyond the next five years, the odds are that markets will be higher five years hence. Mike, when you were 90s at Goldman running the running Internet, Internet was new. How did Goldman... I mean, do Goldman clients, high net worth clients, think the same as everybody else? Or like, uh, is everybody the same? They're just scared of buying all time highs, or they don't can't separate the the news and the economy from the stock market. What do you remember from those days? Now you do it for yourself, but like back in the Goldman days. No, in the Goldman days, again, same thing. I mean, it's only in hindsight that it becomes obvious that hey, the eighties were just an extraordinary period in terms of both the financial and the secular 
technology trends all coming together. Uh, you know, the, the advent of the spreadsheet and PC in the 80s allowed uh, the entire financial industry to rethink how to, how to do computations and new projections and so on. And that, you know, just got started in the 80s and then really hit its way in the 90s, et cetera. But in terms of Goldman, in your question, no, uh, there were there were also lots of things to, for people to worry about all the way through. Remember, uh, you know, the, the phrase uh, 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 irrational exuberance was coined right in the teeth of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of the 90s in terms of the beginning of the internet cycle. Uh, so uh, that's always the case. And so I, I, I kind of go with what Barry's saying, you know, my, the market's going to see go through walls of worry, you've got to look at just a lot of bottom-up underlying drivers and where the alternatives are for people to pop, to put, put assets. The one thing I would say this time around, it just feels unlike in the 90s. In the 90s, you know, we didn't have commission-free trading. We, you know, people people paid, there was a friction to, 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 to trading and investments. So it was mostly an institutional game. And Goldman, we were an institutional shop. Um, and and that was, you know, also the beginning of, of, um, of, um, a lot of the index-oriented stuff, the passive index wave was just starting. All of that was just in the beginnings. We never, we only saw all of that as in hindsight, as as big tailwinds that took the markets to you know the levels that we have today. But those uh, those were secular trends that were kind of independent of of the the things that we all constantly worry about. You know, interest rates, the Fed, um, economy, uh, the blips every quarter, every week, actually in terms of statistics and so on. The, right. I think to shout out to Excel, I don't think people realize, I always talk about this as like maybe still like 30 something years later, probably the biggest boon to the financial markets comes from the spreadsheet, like from, from Excel, like the idea of corp dev, the idea of being able to, to go public at scale. The nothing happens without Excel. Like that, that '90s boom of surrounding Excel. Probably still today, the AI. Uh, there's all these investments trying to automate what Excel still does. Really fascinating. It's like software is eating the world. He moved on. He's he moved on. We're going to talk about that because I know you've interviewed Andreessen, but now he's talking nope. about government. But go ahead, Mike. To Howard's point, it is sometimes the most prosaic of applications that, in hindsight, are the some of the biggest. You look at today in 2024, we're sitting here, you know, the crux of even the AI curve, et cetera, and the way, you know, Apple's uh, dominance in, in iPhones, it's, it's, it's messaging. It's, 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 it's uh, text messaging, which was one of the first things we had even before the internet in the 80s. And so uh, to your point on spreadsheets, yes, I think spreadsheets in hindsight were a massive uh, uh, augmentative, uh, augmentative force for people to make computations and 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 make more det- more knowledgeable decisions about what they were investing on on a bottom up basis before that we had to go you know you you guys are too young uh, to remember this but we had to go to the IT department and have mainframe people basically run projections on on you know what 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 is that that what is that happen if we take the growth rate from 4% to 6% you know, those kinds of things. You couldn't do that. What, what we have right now is, like we said, the headline's bad. We have, yeah, I mean, shout out to Microsoft and Excel. So we've got Microsoft at all-time highs, Excel, AI. We have Netflix pushing all-time highs, streaming, attention. We have Facebook pushing all-time highs, Amazon there. We have Goldman Sachs, you know, my gold Google, uh, Goldman trend, the three Gs. Goldman today crushing quietly no one cares breaking out to all-time highs um and then you had amgen and reject you have biotech although the indexes jc are lagging let's walk through biotech now at least the big caps uh eli literally just did a three billion dollar acquisition um you know good luck if what good luck if a big tech company tried to do a three billion dollar acquisition mike or, or barry think about that eli Lilly. Um, which unless you own the S&P, most people just don't own it, which is why you own indexes. But Lilly gets away with a $3 billion acquisition. Microsoft, uh, those guys couldn't even close a billion dollar acquisition. They, they got to make up ways to do acquisitions right now. But JC, go like, there's the, forgetting the breadth, just the breadth of, because maybe the breadth isn't there in the equal way to blah, blah, blah. But the breadth of like technology making new highs is really insane. So walk us through that. I, 
I, I think what you're seeing from a lot of the laggards, and, and biotech is one of those, small caps in general, as the at the index level anyway, look a lot like this. A lot of these growth stuff, like all these Kathy Wood stuff, all the junky, you know, no earning, you know, tech with no earnings type stuff. A lot of them look like this. And, you know, this is kind of what leads me, what kind of points to this not being a bubble. There's actually a lot of things that have been beaten down and, and completing multi-year bear markets and, you know, working on bearish to bullish reversals that are, it's the exact opposite of a bubble. And you have a lot of these speculative areas, like I said, small caps in general at the index level. Biotechs, you got like 220 biotech stocks in the Russell 2000. So, you know, you got over 10% of that entire index in terms of the components are just little tiny biotech. So it's hard for an index like IWM. And, and by the way, the small cap 600 index, which requires uh, a track record of earnings in order to be included, the Russell 2000 will let anybody in. Both of them look exactly the same, which is really just a, a function of the types of stocks that are not attracting the capital. You're seeing that going into tech. You're seeing it into mega cap growth. You're seeing it into a lot of the financial stocks that have been crushing it. You've been seeing a lot of the industrials, but there are some parts of the market that really haven't gotten going at all. And these are some of the more speculative areas of the market, which leads me to believe if, if this, th th these are not bubble things, quite the opposite. Th let me point you to industrials, guys. So you, you buy pullbacks in bull markets, right, Barry? Right? You want to buy stocks in bull markets. You want to buy pullbacks in the leaders in bull markets. And industrials have been exactly that. Industrials have been a leader. So if this is, in fact, a bull market and industrials are, in fact, a leadership group that haven't done anything in four or five months, uh, by the way, of all S&P sectors, industrials have the highest correlation with the S&P of all of them, right, historically over time. Here we are down at support. So the question is, is this a massive top? Is this like a double top in industrials? Now they're going to come tumbling down, bringing the markets down with it, blah, blah, blah. Or are they going to dig in here and are they going to buy them? like they did software, like they're doing to consumer discretionary, like they've been doing to all of these beat up areas when the buyers needed to show up over the last two years, they've shown up. So are we going to bet that this time is different or is it going to be just like all those other times where the money steps into industrials, you get the sector rotation and off to the races we go. I think it's the latter. Uh, so let me, let me share two really interesting data points because uh, I've been hearing a lot of bubble chatter, and every time I flip on the TV, it's bubble, bubble, bubble. So, so first, when we look at the percentage of unprofitable companies, right, and and look at them during three major peaks and, and crashes: the tech bubble, the financial crisis, and you can even look at it during COVID versus today. You know, let's use the tech bubble because that's really the most extreme. Uh, Forty-one percent of small cap stocks were not profitable. A third, 32% of mid caps were not profitable. And 28% of large caps were not profitable. And that was a bubble. Now you fast forward to today, 44% of small caps are not profitable. 19% of mid caps and only 7% of large caps are unprofitable. And, and whenever people say, well, what about the Magnificent Seven or the Fabulous Five or whatever the phrase of the day is, you know, we have all this concentration. Well, the Magnificent Seven are doing over two trillion, trillion with a T, two trillion dollars worth of revenue, and just about three hundred and change billion in profit profits. Uh, the question isn't why are they almost thirty percent of the S and P five hundred. The real question is why aren't they more? This is the biggest driver. We forget when you're in the middle of something. I don't care if it's flight or spreadsheets or mobile or AI, when you have these secular game-changing shifts that alter society for decades, yeah, you know, the market's going to make speculative bets on everything in that space. I don't know which of them are the winners. I like to buy them all. But you end up with a situation where people focus on that and they say, gee, these industrials, they're kind of running away. Look at how inexpensive the steam companies and leather belt companies have become. When does this mean reversion take place? And, and the answer is when you have a real innovative break, a real technological shift, the answer is never. Mike, you were going to come. I, I, yeah, I, I, would, I would echo what Barry said. And I would also add an, the, an additional framing 
to the Magnificent Seven of the Big Techs. There's something we've been talking about the last few shows, especially last week's show, where we talked about the opportunity for the Big Tech to do spinoffs. But if you look at today's multi-trillion dollar companies, there are five or six of them or whatever the number you want to look at just on the tech side, you know, they have anywhere from three to six to eight, depending on how you count them, businesses within them that each could be worth half a trillion and up. In, and, and we're starting to see the some of the analysis type of work being done. Barron's this weekend did a piece on YouTube uh, okay. as a piece of uh, So they're listening. Google they're piece. listening. Yeah, they're listening. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's, it's resonating. But the point is, you know, we were talking about the 80s and 90s. Back then, when we saw the, the Intels and the, and the Microsoft Windows and so on, the things we we're talking about, Excel, et cetera, they were very sm much relatively smaller businesses. Those tech companies that became the leaders and the big winners, they had one or two core businesses. The you know, Bill Gates of the world focused on them religiously, took them to global domination. But they did not, those companies did not have, I was there, I, I covered those companies. They did not have multiple mega businesses at the same time in the, under the same corporate umbrella. And we have that today, which is why Barry, JC, you guys would agree probably, that the valuations of, of, of tech, et cetera, even though you know people can say, hey, this is bubbly and this and that, the valuations are nowhere compared Correct. to it, what we have. And, and let me tell you thing. another story. So guys, so in the, in the, in the, when did Excel come out, Mike, do you think? Was it in the 80s or 90s? So, 90s? So we, or, or, in that no, not Excel, but the first one, um, Lotus, Lotus 123. When do you think that came out? Back in the 80s, Excel, in the next six or seven years, they became Microsoft's core application, and then they also did Word against WordPerfect, which was the other, you know, the the uh, the, the uh, word processing, which is the other piece of, uh, of the, the other leg of the stool. And, and anyway, so that became Office, and and that all started to grow as a unit for Microsoft in the in the early to mid '90s with Windows 95. So Microsoft hit a trifecta at that point. So let me tell you a story. So in the 80s, when I worked for my dad one summer, and you know, you work with your dad, you're not really working, but you have vivid memories of things that stand out. Obviously, he had a, a red phone that would go to Yorkton Securities right to his broker. Right? Like you had to have a special phone. There was no retail. Like he was a big enough retail that he had a phone directly to Yorkton Securities. But I... Who knew nothing, right? You're the son of, you, you, you know, it's a cush gig. You're working for your dad. I remember him laying, taping, spread paper together when he was doing oil and gas acquisitions because there was no spreadsheet. Like that was in the 80s. And so to look at financials, they'd have to tape together pieces of paper with line items so you could like look at your financials and, and compare them to other people. And so... You know, when I think about what Excel, what Excel did, but but more importantly, as much as as much as we talk about not overvalued, Apple JC is trading at nine times sales. So it's it's you say so. No, I don't know. Like you do the math. I mean, <laughs> so not you, but I'm saying we were just saying. Ask a technician. Yeah, no, I'm just saying I I own Apple, so I, I don't look at that. But I saw that floating around. And I own like, Apple too. I didn't know about the. Uh, I didn't know, what but we talking you know, about when you just own something Oak forever, what is, what is this? you're privy. Like I said, the headlines. People are sharing these headlines. Like Apple's never traded higher than nine times sales. Well, maybe that's because it shouldn't be trading at nine, and maybe that's not the ratio to measure it at. But does that vary? Like if a client calls you and says, "Get that out of my portfolio. It's nine times sales." What do you, What do you say to that person? So first. Um, Typically, it's something along the lines of, depending on the person, either here's why we own Apple as part of a broader um, set of holdings, or alternatively, you're fired. Because if, if you want to manage your own money, go manage your own money. If you hired us to do it, give us the ball, get out of the way. We'll keep you informed, tell you what we're, we're doing, we'll custom fit your portfolio. Now, now, by the way, that's very different when someone says, hey, I work in tech and I don't want more technology exposure. Well, well, then we'll detect their portfolio. But if someone picks a specific stock or I don't like emerging markets, I heard someone say um, in, in a Q&A towards the end of last year. And that just makes me so excited 
about emerging markets. And lo and behold, second best asset class the first half of this year. New two year so, highs for emerging yeah, markets. It, New two year highs for emerging markets. Uh, Ax China. And I looked at a chart today of the technology weighting of EEM, which is the Emerging Markets ETF, over time. Uh, about 15 years ago, it was closer to 10%. Now it's 25, Barry. So it's not Make, like makes a it's lot not of... your father's Emerging Markets Index. And, and the takeaway, whenever any it's I, not I, your I talk about a given markets. stock, that is, uh, that's, that's that, right. You're never going to hear that anywhere but here. Yeah. yeah. What? Whenever I have trained myself, whenever I talk about a sector or a stock, and I have vivid recollections of this taking place with Apple when they introduced the newfangled um, iPod, this digital Sony Walkman, when people like viscerally react, oh, that, that's a piece of crap. They're going out of business. Pay attention because all that negativity is already in the stock price and the upside possibility of, hey, maybe this little digital device might work out. Um, I'm looking if I have an iPod handy. Uh, <laughs> of course I, you I do. It's under Mary the Kung Pao chicken, iPod Barry. Oh, it's somewhere. literally under the Kung Pao chicken. Uh, so, so. Uh, <laughs> but, um, Barry, should Barry, should Apple be in the consumer discretionary index instead of tech? <sighs> That's a really interesting question. Uh, we're out of time. Um, first we're of all, time. that is an unfair first of all, question to ask you, Barry Ritholtz on any podcast. For, <laughs> for, first of all, <laughs> if you speak to parents... It ain't discretionary, so maybe, maybe that's it, maybe it's really a, a staple. staple. Is it a staple? Well, that's now? right. That's right. And <laughs> second, I mean, the utility. they make hardware and software. How, where else? You Michael, go? what do you think there when he when he says that? Go ex Goldman. I, you're, 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 to, you're talking to the to the to the converted. I mean, it's it's beyond it's beyond a consumer staple. It's it's like as as you know, it's it's like it's 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 at the category of food. I mean, you know, we had power go off. Everyone was freaking out, not about the lights, but th there was no internet. <laughs> and there was no <laughs> internet. Uh, screw the lights. Read internet. about my <laughs> impending death on the internet. The, uh, like, the, how am I going to die? I want to see no a preview of I'm my dead. obituary. If I die and no yeah. one sees my tweet, <laughs> am I dead? I guess that's what I... <laughs> that's what right. I if, if a death a fall occurs in the forest, and no one if I take a it, shit really in my happen. pants during a hurricane and I haven't tweeted it, did I shit my pants? Uh, oh my God. All right, Hold so on, throw up. Throw up. Listen, can you take the movie. Maslow hierarchy and, and, and scratch out, you know, output Wi-Fi at the bottom, internet at the bottom, you know, Maslow's hierarchy. Sorry. But, but, no, no, no. You know, you got, you got. Barry, you got Howard's in London going to freaking Wimbledon, so everyone's being all bougie. So why don't you bring up the chart of Ferrari? hitting new all-time highs. And I got a lot of shit this week because I said Ferrari's a great indicator for the consumer, right? Like the consumer discretionary stocks, right? And I got so much shit about how like, you know, me and my rich friends, because I have so many Ferraris, you know, like how I'm so, you know, detached from reality. Am I the one that's detached from reality about Ferrari being a good leading indicator for consumer discretionary? Or is it just that Ferrari is a good leading indicator for consumer discretionary? Like, am I so off by saying that? No. Well, the wealthy lead the middle class consumer, and Ferraris are it's certainly my luxury a economy. Purchase. It's the ultimate luxury right. still. Yep. But the other thing we're missing here, because we were talking about the '90s, back in the in the in the '90s, Ferrari, the the, the majority of their market was basically U.S. and Europe. Okay. Today, you look at Ferrari; the majority of their sales are in Asia, in the Middle East. And then maybe Europe and America. It, the whole whole thing is flipped over. Okay, you talk about LVMH, you talk about all of these things, you know, 150, 200 billion dollars, the demand. The, in a world of 8 billion people, there are a lot of wealthy people than we had in the I'll 90s. I'll tell you, and we, I'll give fashion. you another anecdote. Lanny Lowry lessons is uh, 80 year old, 84? Is bought a Ferrari every year. <laughs> he just bought a yellow Ferrari. Lanny, shout out to Lanny. He can't even fucking get in the thing, uh, and he's in good shape. He's no Joe Biden, but I mean, he like you can't die with it. And there's no other way. You're not going to buy a Hermes purse if you're a guy. So you're going to buy a Ferrari, and your grandkids oh, can Hermes. use it. And Hermes. so you have this aging wealthy generation. I'm not a Ferrari guy. I'm kind of just a, a Porsche guy when I'm not really a car guy, but, um, God bless. Like, so that Ferrari chart, when I see 80 year old men now saying, Hey, I'm going to die. Uh, 
By the way, what what Howard is saying, I'm not a car guy. Every time Howard picks me up somewhere, he's in a different car. Like in the last decade, he's had like the new BMW, and then you're right, like you know, I'm not a car guy. Every time I see you, you got a different car. You will never see a Ferrari in this house. But what I'm saying is, with Ferrari, JC, why is that? I don't know. Why you're too embarrassed? You're a man of the people. No, I just it's loud. It's it's too small. Uh, you don't have to buy a loud it's like one. Saying, I'm yeah, not a and there's a button guy. you can push, I mean, make like it jeans, less loud. Barry knows about guy. it. Barry's a car guy. Barry's the Barry's car guy. guy, and I got him into. It, I don't have a Ferrari, but if I get the town to let me build another garage back there, but what's interesting, JC, is Ferrari goes to all time highs. Rolex watches are down thirty percent from all time highs, so it's not all luxury all the time. This is rotation, even in luxury, uh, amongst brands. That was a pandemic driven outlier um uh, and, and by the way if you look at automobiles there is literally a youtube channel called supercar trader where this guy tracks all of the individual cars to what's near their highs what's come off what's selling many luxury cars many high-end sports cars are substantially off of their highs okay. i'll share that link because it's really a we'll fast link thing. jc anything we'll else technically the very Barry, are you are you suggesting that I have a point here that perhaps the chart of Ferrari is a leading indicator for the consumer discretionary index, considering they move up together, they move down together, they move up together? You think you think that's legit? Say that again. I want to make sure I'm getting that. That the that the Ferrari, it's been moving up with the consumer discretionary over time, moves down with consumer discretionary, moves up, moves down. Um, Ferrari's I don't know. I, it, it hasn't. It's not a negative. It really hasn't been public long enough to track. Um, but, what a combo, you know, Barry. He's right. He's right. I, his, his clients are listening, ja. uh, JC, his clients are listening. No, I don't, I, don't think it's been, I don't think it's been public long enough to draw that sort of conclusion. I, I know what you'd buy, yet. a baby blue one. JC, technically, before I go to things, I want to just go around the horn with like eight things that are bugging me because uh, technically the market's fine. Like technically in – as as Michael and, and and Barry have said, fundamentally you can nitpick, but we're not in a bubble, so it's your Barry. Yeah. Barry studied a lot of bear markets over time. Barry, a historian, never the right. Barry, in these bear markets, how many times are you seeing all time highs in these bear markets? Is that something that happens often? Uh, often. How about never? In fact, one of the reasons bear markets it's a leading are so question, your difficult. Honor. It's a leading question, Your Honor. <laughs> what one of the one of the reasons. You bear markets are so challenging is because the last inning or two of a bull market pulls forward years worth of gains. My favorite example from October 22nd, 1999. I just happen to remember that date because the Fed did a $50 billion stimulus on my birthday for the next six lot. months. <laughs> By March 2000, the NASDAQ had doubled. How many years of forward gains did that pull forward? Uh, and so you don't, in fact, uh, JC and I have talked about this. New bull markets don't begin at generational lows. They begin when you break out to new highs. The generational lows for the 82, 2000 were 74. It wasn't until you get to 82 where you cleared that plot. I'll, I'll talk in JC language, that prior 16 year range of resistance. Once you broke out of that new bull market off to the races 18 years, about a thousand percent on the on the Dow. I don't recall exactly what the numbers were on other indices, but not that far off. Three quarters of which were multiple expansion, not earnings gains. Wonk, wonk, so wonk, not the wonk, 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 wonk. The uh, unbelievable. You guys are dressing alike, sounding alike. It's like technical. Well, me and Barry are agreeing way too much in technical. this conversation. I don't, I don't like this at all. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting really nervous, which, uh, listen, Josh, I mean, JC, are we missing anything? So we've covered, we've covered Netflix, Goldman, uh, MMYT, we uh, talked about all up, the time. Uh, listen, that hit all-time highs. Throw up the today. chart of Goldman, but I, I think there's a bigger story here, right? And throw up uh, the Jeffries and Piper Sandler. These are the types of charts that you know, would lead me to suggest that perhaps we're in the earlier innings of, of something more substantial. It's the next one down. Uh, something more substantial. I mean, look at names like Jeffries and Piper Sandler doing nothing for several years now, completing these bases, breaking out to all-time highs. You know, to Barry's earlier point, again, I hate to keep agreeing with Barry, but he was talking about the S&P 500 breaking out of this massive range. That's when the new leg started in the early 80s. This is a a, a more micro version of that, right? This is a you know, a more cyclical version of what of that structural breakout that 
uh, Barry was referring to. This is a more cyclical breakout within a longer-term uptrend, but it's not just Goldman Sachs. It's capital markets in general, financials, breaking out to new all-time highs. Go to the next one. This is Berkshire Hathaway. Berkshire Hathaway represents 15% of the financials index. It's like a, a big financials hedge fund uh, with industrials mixed into it, basically. You know, you got about 20% of that is Apple also, um, you know, for if you're looking for more consumer discretionary exposure, right? Um, so, you know, Berkshire Hathaway, again, largest component of the financials index. That whole space looks great, keeps acting well. And if financials are doing well, Barry Ritholtz, if, if financials are making new all-time highs, is that historically evidence of deteriorating markets? <laughs> absolutely. Leading question, absolutely Your Honor. Leading not. question. So, you JC, let me throw a book, question to you because... About the damn financials. This is the opposite of Barry's book. It's the exact opposite. So let me throw a question at JC. What do you see out there that's making you nervous in this current environment? Well... If, if I'm nervous, it's because I got my position size is too big. So let's keep that in mind. So it's not so much All right, nervous, so hold, but... hold your own errors aside. I'm talking about in the overall market, yeah, I think not you're, you're when you to, like, back what, up what can, the truck on, on Tesla right before it crashes. What, what, can, what can change sort of the overall structural uptrend that stocks are in currently? And, and I would argue- We're going to end it's the when... last 20 minutes in, guys. So take it away, JC, because I, I got a bunch of topics here. So, so let's go. Yeah, Thanks. so yeah. Um, I think it's when sector rotation stops coming in. You know, people talk about market breadth. It's a thin market. You know, the new highs list, this and that. And while that is true in, in certain cases, we've continued to see sector rotation coming in. Remember, technology got going at the beginning of 2023, at the beginning of last year. In the back half of 2022, almost everything was already working, except for large cap tech. So right when you needed that rotation, you got it coming into last year. Turned out to be the best first six months in the history of the NASDAQ. Boy, did that rotation come in. But discretionary, industrials, financials, they were already working in 22. So then what happened last, you know, at the end of last year, you still weren't getting that strength out of certain areas in financials and small caps. What happened? They absolutely ripped into the fourth quarter and into January, right? And then the sentiment got heated into February. You've been seeing that deterioration of breath underneath the surface. But here's what you're not seeing. You're not seeing an expansion of new lows. So while there certainly have been fewer stocks making new highs, which mathematically is guaranteed con considering everything was making new highs in December. You mathematically can't have more if everything's already making new highs. So of course you're going to have a deterioration. So while you're not seeing new, more new highs, you're not seeing any new lows. And mathematically speaking, you can't have a bear market or a downtrend of any kind without the pr prices of stocks going down. And we just simply haven't seen that. But we have seen Industrials do nothing for four or five months. Financials at the index level do nothing for four or five months. Consumer discretionary, healthcare, nothing, flat. The median stock is flat for the year. So I would argue that that's constructive within an ongoing bull market, resetting sentiment, getting ready for the next leg higher. And if you start to see financials, industrials, consumer discretionary, healthcare breaking out to all time highs, and I think you do, that's confirmation that sector rotation is continuing to come in. If the opposite occurs and you start to see new lows, you start to see industrials, for example, breaking down out of these bases instead of stepping, you know, the buyer stepping in and ripping them. That would be something new. And that would be evidence of deterioration, which we simply have not seen at all. So the answer to your question simply is new lows. Yeah, if we start to that, see the road, we that is the the ultimate answer. New lows coming from a technician, which which matters. But Josh, let me. I mean Barry and 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 sorry Barry and Michael. Let me just bring up. Now let's go through some points that that, that I want to bring up, just because I want to, because technically we're fine. And as jo as as JC says, you got to see new lows and you got to see the sector rotation not happening. So putting all that aside, let's just walk out a little bit. I'm very confused, right? Because I'm in London, supposed to see. Uh, LGBTQ for Palestine everywhere. I'm supposed to see you know, Muslims storming me as a Zionist. And don't get me wrong, I, 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 I indulge myself in paranoia from being on Twitter uh, desktop too often. But let's be honest, we have two half dead person, mostly dead person, and Trump uh, as United States 
representative. Is the market, what's it, Barry, what is the, is the market pricing any of this in? Is the market even looking at the election? Like, shouldn't it be looking right now at the election? So is the market pricing it has, in? It has been. So I've what's the market it. pricing in Barry and then Michael? What is What, what am I supposed to understand uh, here? Uh, I don't think, first of all, we put way too much emphasis on which party controls the White House when we look at, at markets. You go back historically, if you only own uh, stocks when Republicans were in power or only own them when Democrats were in power, you underperform just buying blindly and it doesn't matter who's, who's in power, partly due to com- compounding, partly due to do, it's not relevant. Second, um, when we talk about pricing in, what is the market going to price in? If Trump wins, easier regulations, tax cuts, or bigger deficits. If Biden or another Democrat wins, what are we pricing in? Um, uh, you know, rule of law, but more regulations and maybe higher taxes and slightly lower deficits. I mean, those things don't matter to the simple question hey, what are you doing to feed, clothe, and house your kid? Because that's two-thirds of consumer spending. Then you look at everything else that's out there. On top of that, who's in the White House matters so little to the stock market unless there's a really big mistake made. Um, and look, the the market sold off really rapidly. Um, I think you could make a very obvious case that Trump didn't take COVID seriously but the private sector, with the help of um, government, the um, uh, the the RNA um, uh, vaccines that were developed, that th- there was a lot of um, public monies that went into the private sector to help develop um, or, or things that eventually became the the vaccine, and that would have happened no matter who was president. So, yeah, you had a wicked 34 percent sell off in the beginning of COVID, but you also had a wicked 69 percent recovery later that year. And so it was the best 12 month period in the history of the stock market. I mean, that just tells you you stretch that rubber band too far. Right. It was, you know, what the panic, the the mostly kind of sort of eventually efficient market hypothesis is that over the short term, us primates react in a group and we, you know, swing from the trees and do fling poo and do really stupid things, including panicking. Oh, my God, no one's ever going to go back to work. We're never going to leave our house. There's never going to be a vaccine. It's all going to hell down 34 percent. And what was it like 17 trading days, some crazy period that rubber band was stretched so tight. Then, hey, you know, we're working on a vaccine. This mRNA stuff is really coming along and we could have a vaccine within six to 12 months, not coming from the sitting president, but the head of the National Institutes of Health and Fauci and um, Pfizer and uh, Sanofi and all these other big companies said, no, no, we're very close to a vaccine for this. And that's when the, you know, the that plus the largest fiscal um, stimulus since World War II as a percentage of GDP, CARES Act won was about 10% of GDP. You have to go back to World War II to find something similar. That drove the market higher. Whenever stuff hits the fan, you can rely on Congress critters freaking out and throwing other people's money at the problem to make it go away. That's what happened during so, COVID. So you're saying RAs will save us, and RAs like yourself? No, no. We're, we're just along for the ride. We're not going to save anything. Michael, anything, anything standard here? Listen, it's obviously... The market seems to not care. That's what it's saying right now, the volatility. Because nothing's changed, Howard. Okay. It's not that it doesn't care. It's that nothing's changed. You can see it in the polls. Look at the first slide. So even though there's been rotation in the Democrats, right, the, the winner of the election has not changed at all. So it's it's not it, – the, the market knows what it's getting with both candidates, right? You're either getting Clockwork Orange or you're getting Weekend at Bernie's. <laughs> but they know what – the market knows what it's getting. So there's no like, <laughs> and nothing's changed, right? So like, even though you had the Harris overtake the Biden, right? You have it in the first chart. Trump's stayed steady on the presidential. So okay. it, oh my god, it, the market's interested I'll take in other analogy. things. It's nothing I'll take new. Analogy. Remember, there was no sequel to Clockwork Orange. Multiple sequels and hits 
in Weekend with Bernie's. So, and that's not a political statement, but just want to just fair, fair can, I, Look, can I nominate charge, Idiocracy see? as the film where you all should be discussing instead? <laughs> That, that movie is coming up in conversation. I have not seen it. Uh, send me a link, Bear, but uh, I'll look it up. All right. Is it good? Is it worth watching? Is it worth watching? It's hilarious. Yeah. Sorry, you'd love it's it. It's very funny. You're living in it, by the way. Okay, next up. <laughs> you have been for years. All right. Better- just, just to add, just to add the, uh, the business about uh, politics and, and markets, again, because we were talking about the 90s. My time at Goldman Sachs, we had co-CEOs at Goldman Sachs, and one always used to be a Democrat and one used to be a Republican. It, 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 you know, we balanced it. And, 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 and the reality is, for the most part, to what Barry and Jay-Z is saying, the markets, unless something dramatic happens, like COVID, et cetera, it, it, it's relatively indifferent. And it typically likes gridlock. You see what happened in France. It's, you know, if you look at uh, uh, the, the, the people who are like freaking out, whether it's the right or the left, et cetera, um, and the markets love the fact that it's utter gridlock. Uh, and, and, and they can go and continue to... You know, so, uh, okay, five thousand dollar purses to the rest okay, of the world. Okay, second thing. So, 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 let's switch then to the EU. The EU as a as a as a data iceberg. They have their fucking hard on for America, big tech. Does it make a difference, Mike? I mean, they're making Apple dance. You know, Ben Thompson has a great piece out about EU yeah. is just coming for more data. I'm hearing I, my machines don't work. Like stock to its GB, GDPR. Someone, someone, someone says they don't want uh, some person in, in Lithuania says uh, stock to is selling my data and we've got to change you know, all our term policies because a lawyer for somebody in Lithuania. I'm not saying that shouldn't be the case. That is a tax on small business. You know, Facebook, Amazon, Google, they don't give a fuck about GDPR. I mean, because because it's regulation, they setting the regulation, it's a tax on Howard and, and any small business, right? You have you have Andreessen on one side of his mouth, we got to help small tech. But at the same time, big tech's never been, never been in a better position because all the regulation helps them. So where does the EU, obviously it's hurting themselves, but where do you see this EU, have, like they're, do, they have a hard on for America tech right now. No, I, 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 I'll, I'll, echo, I'll echo Ben Thompson. You know, I, I think we need an antitrust suit against the EU uh, because they're using the legislative power to basically go after almost every U.S. tech company for any kind of range of issues. And, and there's you know, some better steam act, you can argue all the details. But the reality is that they're now taking it even further to putting like 10% global revenue penalties on these companies when... Meta and Apple, you know, less than 10% of their business is in actually Europe. They could actually walk away from the whole $500 million. You're saying uh, the numbers aren't big enough to really, because it seems like the markets are ignoring the fact that EU is creating a nightmare, but you're saying it's just not. No, you you look at how the EU is structured. It's wonderful. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's, 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 it's it's essentially a monetary union without a country. Uh, I mean, they still haven't, you know, the 40 years in, Decided to even become a country yet, and they're mucking around like saying, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna basically uh, Apple, you gotta you know take away the lightning uh, connector and do a USB C," and, and that was because a 34 year old in one of the European countries made it his cause celebre in Brussels, and they made it happen. It's awesome. Look, I'm not arguing against against the Europe doing what they should do for their markets that they think, but right now, and there are other other thoughtful people like Ben and others who are making these um, uh, very broad assessments that if you look through this, they're they're basically um, gone away from actually talking about the good for for their people to the point where to actually technically implement some of the solutions they're asking for, the actual implementation of the technologies will not, you know, the way it has to be done is not being, it is not possible. That's why Apple is not because they want to be you know, use a, a stick against the EU, maybe that's part of it. But because technically, Apple intelligence, the way if you look in the weeds of how they're talking about it, it's actually very difficult, almost impossible to implement, given how they're, they're trying to legislate it. So, so there's, the regulation is getting way ahead of the reality of the technology. And, 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 and in other cases, that the, the, the rulings that they're, uh, they're focusing on are fighting yesterday's wars. AI, we know one of the topics we were going to talk about is just the amount, immense amount of investment that's ahead of these companies and so on. That's they're investing in the next two or three years what they won't recoup for probably five, 10, 15 years. 
And, and, and Europe is going to be a huge beneficiary of this. Uh, Apple, uh, Microsoft, Meta, Google, all of these companies, massive investments. And, 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 and the Europe is basically saying, hey, we want to tax all of this stuff way before all of this. And, and, and prevent you from doing this. And I think that's, a, that's an issue. Well, here's the issue that, we that I see. So really appreciate that, Mike. But what I'm saying is, I agree with you here, but, and this may be why small caps, like JC said, with biotechs and small financial companies and small tech companies, like, uh, and, and I say small tech, including private tech like StockTwits, is we're affected by those laws. We can't brazenly, we still got to hire a lawyer in Europe for one to five grand a month on retainer to deal with GPDR. So there's even a small company like Stockton, that's 60 grand a year for uh, Lithuanian somebody to keep on retainer. And that's a tax that Facebook can afford to pay. That's not a tax that our U.S. small. So we, we're getting, for, this is, goes to small caps, we are getting fucked. You know? to, and, and their rock and recent is totally on point in terms of fighting for living. To, to be uh, fair, more important in Europe because to your point the cost the costs of this stuff are are uh, about the uh, capabilities of the small to, to be fair that. the privacy laws in the US are garbage they're shit and somewhere between the EU at one extreme and the US as the wild west um, it is where an intelligent policy lay but the fact that you know uh, your cell phone is in private your data isn't your own the email spam the phone, spams the it leads to billions and billions of dollars in fraud and losses which are absorbed by the consumer and sometimes big tech has to step up and say like i i, I don't understand why verizon hasn't or other bells haven't done something about all of the various you know spoofed calls and things i don't think a technology solution is difficult for that and the result is that you know, uh, who who still has a landline at home? I have terrible cell service where I live. The only reason I have a landline is to occasionally let the utilities know that the power went out. And I have a <laughs> gas generator, so I could, you know, go for weeks without ever responding. So to me, it's there, Barry, there has you, to be a happy medium. You are hitting uh, the nail on the head. You, you pointed it at Verizon and the telcos. Most legislators have not done that. The, the telcos have been some of the biggest uh, benefactors of, of, of DC uh, for a long time. If you look at who the, the regulators are holding up, you know, it's Zuckerberg, it's, it's, it's Satya Nadella, it's Sundar. It's seldom the CEO of Verizon or T-Mobile or, or AT&T or whatever, because those companies for 20 years have been selling your data uh, way before. Uh, Facebook even figure out how yes, to put Equifax, on the, Experian, on the, on the, TransUnion. Yeah. Go look at the pre-Facebook yeah. Facebooks. All right, one one subject. Our privacy is already been right. way before tech. Let's let's end with AI because JC is going to go. Let's end with AI. We'll have Barry back. AI. The CEO of of Microsoft was at Aspen. Okay, because data is important. All of it. We just brought up data on one end. Data is important to small businesses like myself too. We've spent seventeen years building our own data. Microsoft's. AI CEO came out and said, fuck you. Uh, obviously, he's talking his book. I forget his name. You know his name because you-, you Sadia Nadella. Yeah. No, 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 no. They're, C they're CEO of AI. Oh, okay. Okay. He came out and said, Whichever he said he looked me in the eye. He looked A24 in the eye. He looked New York Times in the eye. He looked everybody basic in the eye. He's talking his own book. Mike, where, where does this, this feels, this feels like a big battle brewing. Right. He's talking his book. He's saying if, you know, and Elon Musk lost his first lawsuit. He says you can't have it both ways. Twitter's you don't own your data. So, so, so let's walk through this a little bit for everybody. He said in a more full throated way what OpenAI, Microsoft, Google, et cetera, have been saying for a while, which is that there is a fair use element of our data uh, for the Googles or the, for all of these companies. And they're, they've been rapidly since the chat GPT moment of November 22, they've been rap all rapidly changing their terms of service on every product that, you know, two, three billion people use, saying that basically now we can take your data and do generative AI with it. What Suleiman said, what Mustafa Suleiman said was, it, 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 made, it was made out to be more aggressive than it probably meant it at the time, because I watched it several times. It's on YouTube. It's worth watching. But he was basically saying that, look, 
ultimately, as all of this data and the new data that's coming gets uh, uh, used for AI uh, with permission most of the time, uh, that, that we are going to find that there is, there is a massive societal good out of it in terms of fair use. Um, and when the legislation um, all is, is, is gone through and the negotiations are gone through, we will find that there will be a net good out of it. The way it came out in the headline, it basically made it sound like this data is all ours. So it made for a great headline if you look through, look between between the lines. So he said, I think he said it in a little bit more aggressive way than he probably meant to say it. But that is the directional uh, comment that most of the AI companies and the researchers are thinking about this. If at any point this this thing goes to the Supreme Court and it shoots down fair use of training data, like across the board, and it sticks. Then the then the entire AI industry will be back 10, 15, 20 that, years. That's not so. that's not what fair use is. If you want to you fair use is to take a small amount of something and use it in public discussions. If you're the Wall Street Journal, you have this massive library of your own internal contact content that you can use to train your own AI. The same goes for Bloomberg or the Washington Post or any big content producer to turn around and say, you have a century of data. That we're going to use to build this, and it's fair use. That's I gotta call bullshit on that. Hey, if you want to license it, here's what it's going to cost you. Tell you what, give us twenty percent of the company, and you can have all our data. Otherwise, go fuck yourself. See you in court. But Barry, that's what I would advise. What I say these again to small companies like Starkwitz, this goes to small caps underperforming. They we're getting squeezed on both ends, small caps, because you got the EU making regulation more expensive for smaller companies. And then you have the the, the FANG saying, good luck, sue us. Uh, we're training our data. Good luck finding that. Go retain a lawyer or a series of lawyers. So so we have well, a series. Well, are they training their data again, on stock twits? That What's should that? be your data. How if can we prove, but if Microsoft doesn't want to pay us, then how do we prove that they're using our models to train us? Which goes to Goldman coming up, Michael. That's a different story. Right. Like I'm saying... Who cares if I'm right or wrong? Go but look at look at the small cap. Look at the S and P 600 small cap uh, technology index, and you know, for all the talk about mega caps dominating and small caps can't keep up, look at the first chart that I just put here on the doc. That's the small cap technology index. Look at the top components. Tell me if you recognize any of these companies: Fabrinet, SPS Commerce, Insight Enterprises, Badger Meter. Uh, Marathon Digital Holdings, we know, Form Factor, Axelis, Itron, ACI Worldwide, Advanced Energy Industries. I never heard of most of these companies. Those are the largest components of this index that has been in a long-term structural uptrend. Hasn't done anything in two or three years, but pushing up against the new all-time highs, I wouldn't short this with I wouldn't short this with Lindsay's money. You know, like this is <laughs> you, you wouldn't get much I mean, carry is, with that, right? Man. Like this is the opposite of what people are saying. It's only seven stocks and the mega caps and all this right. is bullshit. Right. No, we're with you. I'm you just know, trying to bring up points that it's not this goes to it's not just about uh there is some scary things out there as a business person. We're up against the EU, which crazy laws, and Microsoft doesn't have my interests in mind, and nor does Ben Thompson when he is, whether he's right or wrong, it ain't helping small, really small cap. But Goldman came out with 31 pages, Mike, that says, and Barry will end with this, it said, uh, you ain't getting that trillion back. And now, I love when Goldman's salty like this. The Goldman's back to being Goldman. They're not investing in stupid fintech. They're just making markets. They're pillaging. Uh, they're creating havoc. They're making people think. They're writing, you know, provocative headlines like this. Mike, what's your take? You were at Goldman. You would, would write pieces like this or you would oversee pieces like this 30 years ago, 20 years ago. No, I have it right here. It's a, a couple of observations. Number one, it's not a research report. It's a discussion. Uh, with uh, with their uh, tech analyst, the internet He's analyst, pretty good analyst. And, He's a pretty good analyst. You know, but but if you read between read the thirty pages here, those two analysts are actually on the bullish side of the of the of the of the span. The the people who are on the negative side, who who's, who are getting the headlines that Goldman is bearish, is uh, is the director of research. Uh, I used to have a director of research that I would report to, and he and I would have, and we had I had two of them. We would have. 
these kinds of discussions all the time, never in a public report like this. But you know, and his job was to be bearish, and 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 and, and we would we would have a very beefy intellectual discussion, and this is a very good discussion of. And they they also got an economist from the outside who happened to happens to be bearish on AI, basically saying over the next decade. AI will add less than 1% to incremental growth in the world's GDP. That is in direct contradiction to Jan Hatzius, who is the senior Goldman economist, who has a separate report you can access right now. He, uh, he published it last year. He's calling for up to 7% incremental growth from AI over the next decade. So a $112 trillion economy will see $7, uh, trillion. seven eight, nine trillion dollars mm-hmm. Of increment from AI, so there's a very big aspect. This is very Goldman, you know. It's like a co-CEO. One is a Democrat, one is a Republican. Very They're on both sides of it. And if you if you read that that the internet technology analysts who are looking at this from a bottom up perspective, their view is more along the lines of what I've been talking about, which is yeah, the the expenditure of uh, one two hundred billion a year by the Metas and the Microsofts of the world is probably a little bit more aggressive than investors would like in terms of when they might recoup it because the visibility on the new products and services around AI are still murky because they have yet to be invented and yet to go mainstream. But uh, so so we may be ahead of ourselves by two, three, four years, but when it happens, it will, it will more than make up for this. And we have evidence from previous tech cycles for this. Uh, and I can point well, to stuff. And it's in probably a better spend. We'll end it with Barry, but it's probably a better spend than seven Ubers, seven hundred brokerage apps, and the metaverse. So, so whether they're overspending on AI is probably still better than spending on more Ubers and more and more uh, five minute delivery services and uh, more bra uh, e commerce companies. Although I'm all for bras and um, and more. Um, uh, a metaverse. Barry, go ahead and then we'll let so, Mike. Go ahead, so, Mike. so hold the seven, the Magnificent Seven or the Fabulous Five companies. Uh, th- think about NVIDIA, Microsoft, Google, Meta. I guess you could put Amazon and even Apple in that. Think about the other 495 companies in the S&P 500 or the 400 companies in the mid cap index that are going to use AI to become more efficient, more productive, um, and contribute more to the overall economy. I have this conversation all the time. We're 60 people managing $5 billion with multiple podcasts, multiple blog sites, multiple TV, radio, and, and print appearances. Go back 25 years, it would have taken 150, 200 people to do what we do with just 60 people, what we did with 30 people for the first few years. Now apply that to not the Fabulous Five, but every other company that is exploring that. And I don't care whether it's call centers or uh, help help areas or or anything like that. Just on the podcast, I, I throw a couple of questions into ChatGPT and Perplexity to see if I miss something, to see if I there's a source I missed. Uh, yeah, I do the work, um, and my researcher does the work. But it's just another check, and I can't tell you how many times I find things that we Google didn't find. And now extrapolate that across all of society. You know, we're there are no internet companies anymore. We're all internet companies. We all have websites. We all operate online. Imagine th- back in the day before telephones and faxes, hey, I need a document side. Get a messenger, send them across <laughs> town with a leather sassel, satchel on oh, a bike, a have them sign the signatures and bring it back. I mean, think about how unproductive and inefficient that was. I, I, we haven't even begun to scratch the cue, surface cue of what Little this House is going to do. Prairie. Cue uh, the opening music from Little House on the Prairie and um, Game of Thrones. It's a mix of Little House on the Prairie meets Game of Thrones. All right, Mike, last word, and then we're going to let JC, we're all going to go. I'm going to go to bed. What do you got, Mike, on that subject? Very good. No, I, I just wanted good to take Barry. No, I, I just wanted to echo again the the points we're making that yes, the investments may be ahead a bit, but the benefits from this array of technology, the AI technology, uh, if we end up spending a trillion dollars over a decade, which is what this report and other reports are talking about, we are going to get more 
leverage, the kind of the kind of leverage that Barry's talking about that we got from the internet and PC, we're going to get probably two to three times multiples of that because the fundamental nature of this technology that basically looks at everything humankind has created digitally and then summarize it very quickly on the fly to give you suggestions, that requires massive compute. The compute that the that this report and others like Sequoia and others are talking about, you know, six hundred billion dollars a year. This money is better spent fa faster to accrue back in returns potentially than the trillion dollars that the telecom industry spent uh, to build out the backbone of the internet in the nineties, and we went down in the in the crash of two thousand one two thousand two. Less than two percent of that bandwidth was being used uh, by uh, by um, by uh, companies, but in the next 10 years, guess what? Netflix, et cetera, ended up using over half that bandwidth. We're going to see that kind of use of this data center, GPUs, chips that we're talking about that, you know, that is yeah. multi billion dollars. We're going to see Barry being able to run 50 billion. It's why billion. I'm bullish on stock. Uh, it's in a bag. It's why Netflix, Spotify going up. It's why Snap might be breaking. It's why Pinterest is breaking. It's uh, the only people not, it's not helping is dating right now. Bumble and, and Tinder are for shit. I, I will, I'm going to let everybody go, Barry. We got to have you back. Uh, great to see you. You're looking good. Uh, just a reminder, the trend is your friend. Uh, we say that here every week, but we don't say it. The second thing is, especially in the world of AI, there's no such thing as information. I was with JP, and it's my favorite quote. There's no such thing as information overload, only filter failure. Um, be careful which headlines you're reading, if any. Um, filter, filter, filter. Gentlemen, uh, thanks, for, thanks for making this happen. Uh, good to see you. We'll see, uh, we won't see you, Barry, next week, but uh, it's good to have you on. We'll have you back. My pleasure, man. See you, gentlemen. Good to see you. Enjoy everybody. London. Thank Go. you. Cheers.